All right, we've got Matt Sanders, a.k.a. M. Shadows, the frontman for metal band Avenged Sevenfold here with us today. Matt, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm having a, uh, a uh, hell of a month here, getting ready for rehearsals and or doing rehearsals, getting ready for tour, production, uh, lots in Web3. Uh, I'm doing great, though, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to be alive at this moment. How are you doing? That's that's awesome. I'm good. How are you, Stephen? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Matt, you uh, you mentioned um, new album tour. Um, how are preparations for all of that going? It's been really um, kind of chaotic, but really um, good because we we kind of had the foresight to know it was going to take a while to get the gears rolling again. So we started very very early. Um, which is something that it's a luxury that, you know, a lot of us procrastinators will kind of, you know, wait till the last minute and think everything's going to fall into place. And I'm glad that we didn't do that. We've been, um, we've been dealing with production. We've been dealing with how the new stage is going to look. We've been dealing with finishing the record, a rollout, and then also rehearsing and making sure the old songs sound good and the new songs sound good and that it all works together. And, I'm a lot of a new crew, um, you know, with after COVID, a lot of um, people left the industry or you had to kind of go kind of steal people from other bands and try to figure out how you're going to get on the road and how you're going to get along with it. So meeting a lot of new people and really trying to uh, vibe with their personalities and then also um, make sure that we're putting on a show for the fans that they're going to be you know, proud to see and happy to see. So it's been great because we started early, but it has been a lot of work. Nice. Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned Web3 already. Um, you've you've done a lot in that space already, but let's start with the most recent thing that you've announced, uh, Ticketmaster NFT gated ticket sales. Uh, I know we spoke about this recently. You guys spearheaded that with BitFlips and worked with Ticketmaster to bring that to life. Can you tell me a bit about the kind of process of of coming up with that idea, working with Ticketmaster and then launching it? Well, you know, I think first off, uh, the idea was to kind of launch the Death Bats Club a year ago to kind of not only educate our fans on what it was, but to give them time to kind of get their footing um, because it's such a new technology for a lot of them. And um, we understood that if we can get partners, whether it's Spotify or Shopify or Ticketmaster or or the record label or anything that could be, you know, on-chain royalties or all these like grand ideas we had, we knew we had to have the actual token out first, which would be kind of our connective tissue to all these different things. Um, but we also knew that if we put the token out while we were doing a new album and we were kind of throwing these things on people and they weren't really um, secure with what the club was or what it could be, that that could cause its own set of problems. So in launching it a year ago, um, we had the ability to not only get our project manager dialed in and the, the fans kind of dialed in and knowing that they're discussing things on discord and see sort of these little things we were doing. We were also able to go behind the scenes and kind of talk to some of these major players that we were going to need kind of partnerships with to see if we could add value to our token. Right. And when you think about death bats club, it's really an avenge sevenfold token. That's fan centric, almost like a rewards club for being a part of this thing. So one aspect of it, was getting tickets to the real fans sooner, or at least without a lot of the trouble that you go through by sitting in a long queue, et cetera, et cetera. So Ticketmaster was one of the first big boys to come to play with us. You know, they're one of the ones that, you know, we have a tour coming up and we had a little bit of a, a we had a relationship with them and we said, hey, we want to do this. And they already had a Web3 team going. And so we started talks with them probably a year ago. And about six months ago, we really got into the weeds of what this would look at like. And we figured that pure Web3 tickets, like pure NFT tickets, were a little too much of a, a step for people at this point. You know, selling out the form or MSG and telling people they had to have a MetaMask wallet didn't seem like a good idea to us. So the compromise and the idea was let's start with token gated tickets. Let's make sure they have a token on this small number of people and then work with them in that way. So Ticketmaster has been great because they've allowed us to kind of do whatever we want in that aspect, kind of have trusted us. And they've built out a system that really um, seems to have been 
a, a success for the fans. And now we can see where we can take it from there. Um, and yeah, you mentioned the fans. How have they responded to the uh, to the token gated uh, NFT tickets? Um, has it been a sort of generally positive response? Has there been any pushback? I think we've gone through waves, and right now it's a much more positive um, reaction after we released the thing called Ticket Pass, which we can get into. Ticket Pass was a free Polygon token that we dropped to any fan that wanted it. And then we would kind of think of your Polygon token as a scorecard, right? All the things you're doing in your everyday life, you're listening to music, you're buying merchandise, you buy a vinyl, you scan these NFC tags, and we kind of give you a, a, little, a, a little score and then we can upgrade your ticket to get your, your Polygon token to get tickets even earlier. Once we release that, I think fans are like, okay, these guys really aren't just trying to scam us of our money because they hear NFTs, they hear scam. They thought, okay, this is actually a use case that we think is actually pretty cool. And we had a bunch of fans that were not in the Death Bats Club that seemed to really round out the group of like the Web3 crypto NFT Death Bats Club who kind of understood it from a year ago to now this new group of people that are kind of being helped along. You know, the Death Bats Club people are kind of putting their arms around them and saying, come with us over here. This is how you do this. This is how you work your MetaMask, your Coinbase wallet. And so you kind of are attacking people on both sides saying, hey, there is a part of the club that you could join and it does cost some money. And there's another thing we're trying to do for you where it costs you no money. And we're trying to utilize this technology in a way that really is beneficial to you. So I think that had a lot of positive impact on people. Um, but there's also a lot of people that simply want nothing to do with new technology, right? And that's, and that's okay too. You're going you're gonna to get that. Um, but we haven't actually taken away any of those people's rights, right? Those people still can buy ticket on Friday and they can sit in the queue and be pissed off and go to their Twitter and yell at Ticketmaster. Um, but there is a solution for them in a way. I know that you have like, you know, really large scale aims here for ticket pass, you know, long term. You've you've talked about like people scanning NFC tags and the merchandise they buy, or maybe getting credit for Spotify listening habits. You know, how do you see this scaling up over time? I see it exactly like that, right? So we work with Verify, um, who does these NFC tags. And it's as simple as basically just saying, yeah, I bought this, or yeah, I listened to this. And the, the, the point is to be seamless for the user. Because my argument with Web2 music listening is that it's pretty damn good for the user, right? You pay $9.99 a month, and... You listen to anything you want. I mean, the catalog of every piece of music from human existence is there and you get to listen to it and you can have a free tier or you can have a paid tier, but you know, one is just the difference of listening to some ads. And so my argument was always how, why add blockchain unless it's going to make the experience better. And so how I see it right now is just keep listening the way you're listening. And we're going to be able to track that on our end. We'll do the work and we can see what your habits are, what you're buying, what you're listening to. And then we're going to reward you with these little tokens that authenticate that that's you. And I think that's the coolest use case because um, it doesn't ask the fan to do anything more than what they're already doing. And it rewards them in a way of something that is truly valuable to them because there's so many fans out there that can't, wake up at nine o'clock or, or can't be on the internet for three hours sitting in a queue to get tickets to their favorite band. And what they're left with is a resale market that is so inflated and so insane. And, and they're so hit with FOMO that they're missing out on this sort of thing where it's like, well, you've been loyal to us for three years and you've got that tier one pass. And then you don't have any of that to deal with. And so we do have things to figure out. We're not solving all the problems. We're simply creating another lane for people that that are proven to be fans. And we think blockchain is the easiest way to authenticate people um, as long as we can do our job and build it on the back end correctly. In terms of reducing the friction for the for the fans, particularly the casual fans, do you think we're we're reaching a point where you know, a casual listener can can get up to speed with uh, setting up a wallet and, and that sort of thing, or are there still technical hurdles for them to overcome? There's a few technical hurdles, but I remember, you know, in dealing with like a Polygon token a year ago, 
right? You had to import that token into your wallet. You had to do all these things, bridging things. You had to send things certain ways. And what I found out, you know, with this year, which when BitFlips really dug into it, they were able to simply have you download a wallet, press a signature on our website. You didn't have to go to the Polygon network. You didn't have to do anything. We airdrop you the token. And when they bought tickets on Ticketmaster, they didn't have to switch um, to a, you know, a different network. They didn't have to do anything. We were able to work around all that because the technology is coming more, right? So the way I like to describe it, and I know it's not, it's not the same thing and I'm not, um, listen, everyone knows when you go try to explain to your mom, the new iPhone, how we get it. And then they don't want to like, they don't want to like try these new things. Right. Or like, why does that guy next door have food being delivered to his house? Well, he downloaded, you know, DoorDash or Postmates. Well, I don't, well, I don't want to get involved in the tech and I want to do it. Well, okay. Then you don't get door, you don't get food delivered to your house. There's certain things you have to do if you want the benefit. Right. And, what we're asking people is simply all you have to do is download a wallet and you have to go to our website and just click sign. That's all you have to do. And everything else will just fall into place the way. And so you're right. There is that sort of barrier, but a lot of that is being patient, empathetic towards people and kind of, again, putting your arm around them and saying, come over here. This is, there's a benefit for you. Can we take you down the street and show you what we're doing over here? But there will always be people that are resistant. And those will be the loudest people screaming about, you know, AI or, or apps and technology and blockchain, especially when you go and you've got Bill Maher on and they're talking about something they simply don't understand. And they're completely surface level skimming across something. And they're just selling a narrative to piss people off and get them all worked up. So I get it. But at the end of the day, there is a truth there. There is an undeniable underlying technology and truth there. And I believe that the human race always figures out how to let those things win out. We just have from the beginning of time for what we've evolved through, you know, um, fire was dangerous, but we use fire all the time now. <laughs> I mean, everything we've, we've kind of invented and figured out, um, we, we figure out a, a use case in the way that, that humans can use it in a better way. So it's not the greatest analogy, but the technology will win out in the end, in my opinion. I know the band recently did a, a pretty large scale ARG or alternate reality game that was tied into NFTs. Uh, can you tell me about that initiative and how it worked? And, and do you think that it helped your fans understand Web3 better? So we were, the, the idea was to be a little niche with it and do something for the super hardcore fans. Um, you know, it wasn't going to be the 30 second teaser on Facebook, like, Hey, come check us out on Friday. We're going to put a new song out. This was supposed to be fun. It was an ARG where people thought we got hacked and we thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to take all of the kind of the bleeding edge of where technology is right now and kind of meld it with the internet web two, whatever, whatever that is. Right. And so the idea was to take AI. And so a small thing we did is we have a podcast and we were quote unquote hacked and an AI version of me uh, announced a cancellation of a show. And the idea was that you have to be very careful with what you believe nowadays with deep fakes and artificial intelligence and things that are going to be coming out from celebrities or artists or whatever it is. And the idea was to kind of have this melting pot of web two interacting with AI interacting with web three. And so as the scavenger hunt went on and there was AI elements and there was IRL elements and there was um, Sudoku puzzles and there was, um, you know, um, all sorts of almost like scientific or crossword puzzles type things like these things that people had to jump through hoops to kind of figure out encryptions, right? There was all sorts of fun things, ciphers, all sorts of that kind of stuff. And then it led you to this sort of web three free mint on polygon where the tokens were the actual clues and you had to use tokens as a community to put them in a certain order to unlock the song and so we the idea was to kind of get our our tech forward thinking fans working together with people that who had wild ideas and crazy ideas and kind of implementing them in a way that the tech was kind of driving this this narrative forward and the overarching narrative was things are going to get real weird real fast right? With, with not only web three, but with AI, but it was also come together as a community and figure this out. And you guys are going to be the ones unlocking this song. So we thought it was just fun. There wasn't any kind of grand scheme or plan other than 
let's get people um, involved in these things. And I think it did get some more people involved because you saw a lot of people in a lot of people that were deeply invested in the web two AI portion that once they got to the web three part, they needed the help of the discord who had already, you know, had a year and a half of experience with setting up a wallet and minting these NFTs. And so you saw a lot of people jump in and just want to mint these free NFTs and see if they could help figure out the clues. So it, it was a fun way to show people it didn't have to be financial, right? It was 0. 0.003 cents and they're minting these things at will. And it was, I think we got up to almost a million mints, a 900,000 mints we did, which is pretty damn cool. So we've talked a lot about the the fans and the community around the band. Um, what's the response been from within the music industry to your Web3 efforts? Um, when when price go high, uh, we had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of bands reaching out to us. Um, when price went down, we didn't hear from anybody. Now, obviously, during that time, we were building the Ticketmaster stuff, and we came out with the Ticketmaster stuff, and we got a lot of people kind of coming back going, oh, that's crazy. How did you do that, right? Or how did you get them to do this? And um, and so, but none of them, you have to think about what this industry really is. The industry, if, if managers wanted to do all-in pricing on tickets, for instance, one thing, they could. Ticketmaster gives that option, right? Where the, the service fees all wrapped into one thing, but now your ticket goes from $79 to $99 or $100. And the managers, the people that kind of run this, like the protection of the artist, right? They're standing in front of the artist with their black suits on saying, we're protecting the artist. No, we're not going to do that because we want the fan to think that the artist is selling a $79 ticket. And then we want them to be mad at Ticketmaster or whatever ticketing agency is going to do a fee. This whole thing happens in every aspect of their lives, of our lives. And I get it. I, there's a reason for that, right? Um, when you talk about things like taking a step into ticket gate, uh, ticket gated sort of things or digital fan clubs or blockchain fan clubs, there's a lot of people watching us, but a lot of convincing that needs to be done by a lot of people that are going to be making these decisions. A lot of bands aren't going to be in the mud or in the weeds like we are um, building this stuff. And so I talked to a manager the other night and their whole thing was, you should sell this to Live Nation. And our, 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 we were like, we don't want to sell it. Like we're building stuff for artists so that it doesn't go into the hands of other people. And then it's like, well, but how are you going to get our, other artists to jump in? We're like, it's going to take some people with balls that see this as a better way. It's going to take our fans going to other shows and going, why don't you do it like this? We had a better experience at the event show. Why aren't we being rewarded for listening to your music, Metallica, or whatever it is, right? Um, why aren't we being rewarded on a way that's trackable on the block? So it's going to take time because there are people in this industry that simply don't want their ass on the line if this doesn't work out. And that's really what every business is, right? And so the, there's been a lot of people kind of cheering us on on the sideline, but I think it's going to take some people with big balls to kind of jump in and go, okay, we're going to, we see what's happening here. Let's get involved and let's, let's bring our artists into this or let's, Let's let's take some chances on this thing. Like we're we're kind of just I think we're just kind of crazy people anyways. We put out records that sound different every time. We change our live show every couple of years. We we like taking chances. We find it to be really fun and, and exciting and exhilarating. And we're not taking dumb chances. We're not just trying to, you know, every single chance that comes our ways, but we're seeing an opportunity here where we can really mold what the landscape looks like for the artist because it's coming from an artist. And so we don't want to let that opportunity pass us by because, again, going back to earlier, the technology will win out, but it's going to be who has a say on how that technology is used. And in my opinion, I'd rather have an artist having a big say in it and not other people, right? Tech companies or whatever it is that has a different agenda. I know that you've personally been in Web3 for a while now. Like, I remember writing a story more than a year ago about uh, V1 punks and crypto punks, and I know that you were into both of those. You know, what, what pulled you into this space in the first place? Um, I, I start, like, to be honest, I started seeing stuff about crypto punks, like, on, in mainstream news or something. Um, I obviously had had Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin and all that stuff in, like, around 2016 or so. Um, but what clicked with me was this sort of 
image in the metadata, like this sort of like thing that can, like I'm a gamer. So I understand, um, digital goods, right? I understand that I want to have that avatar or I want that hat or I want that gun or I want, you know, whatever it is. And, and I understand if there's a scarcity to it, I understand that you can't right click, save a gun in call of duty and bring it into call of duty. Right. I understand there's like this technical, um, boundary of what the blockchain can do. Right. So when you're looking at crypto punks, I understand that I can tell if it's real or not. And there's something cool about that. If you buy into the idea that the internet world is just as important or very close to as important to the IRL world that we live in. I buy into that personally. I don't need everyone to buy into that. I understand what it means to have a crypto punk. And so when I started seeing the crypto punks and me and Joe from BitFlips got together and he'd already been buying crypto kitties and messing around with the tech, but I saw that and I was like, okay, I have all this Ethereum. I have all this Bitcoin. I really want a crypto punk. So I started shopping for crypto punks and then I found the discord. I downloaded discord because of NFTs and I just started hanging out in the crypto punks discord and really learning a lot about the tech and the future use cases. I think I heard about the sandbox for the first time in there. I started hearing about like metaverses and all these things that people were talking about. And this was a very sophisticated forward thinking group of people in the early crypto punks discord days. And I honestly learned a lot from them and I, and I, you know, became friends with a lot of them in, in real life. And, um, and then when the board apes eventually came out and minted, you know, we all minted those. And then I, and I saw that it was a club and I was like, Oh my God, they're like a club, but they don't have anything to offer yet. But the, the community is the club. Right. And so they started with all the money they raised, they became a club. And I was like, aha, Avenged Sevenfold's a club, but, but we have tons to offer. So why aren't we using this technology to, to give it to them in a better way? And that's what spawned the idea of Death Bats Club. It was a combination of crypto punks and Bored Ape Yacht Club. And I was going, and it was like, oh my God, this is, this is the future if everyone, you know, buys into it the way I've bought into it. Uh, you mentioned the possibilities for gaming and sort of how the idea of digital ownership already, already resonated with you. Um, on the topic of Web3 gaming, is is that something that you're excited about? Do you think that that's something that's really going to take hold in the gaming industry at some point? I think it's insane that we pay the money we pay for the skins that we pay. I have kids, right? And I, my bill is insane every week. And the fact that we don't own any of it, I don't even care if they never resold it. I want to own it. I don't own any of that stuff, right? If Fortnite goes down or they take a skin out or they tell you we're doing LeBron James jerseys for 24 hours and they, then they sell more of them later, like, and they've done that. Um, I think it's crazy. And I don't think a skin, I mean, look at CSGO, like these, these skins go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sometimes I'm not saying every skin has to go for that charge 499 charge 199, but now it's on the polygon network or it's on some sort of gaming network where you can actually sell them. And then later, you know, interoperable sort of games and bring stuff in and out. That doesn't, that's not going to be tomorrow. It's going to be in the deep, deep future, but that's a, a really good use case. And and I also think there's games like Shrapnel where it's super scary, right? You go in there and it's like playing Tarkov, but if you lose your shit, literally someone can take your gun that's worth $10,000 and bring it out. I mean, that's like, there's so many like levels of like, it could be scary cool and be a total degenerate gambling crazy, or it could be just simply what our kids are doing and it's backed by the blockchain. You don't even need to know it's backed by the blockchain. But if my kid wants to sell a Fortnite thing right now, it's extremely hard. And they don't, and they're, and they're going through all these intermediaries to do it. I just think it's a no brainer. And I think they'll, they will figure out new use cases. But the thing about games is games are hard and you have to have a great game first. It can't be, oh, we're an NFT game and here's our game. It has to be, this is a great game and everyone wants to play it. And by the way, there's this technology on the back end where you can sell your own shit. To me, that's where it's going to, you know, where the rubber is going to meet the road. It's not going to be, we're web three gaming, you know, like it, it, it doesn't make any sense that way. The same reason why I think death bats club where we maybe had a little bit of a, a branding issue was it shouldn't be an NFT club. It should just be the, it's our fan club and it's run on the blockchain, but the blockchain part should be a little part. It should be, Oh, by the way, if you want to leave, you can sell your token. And by the way, you own the IP. And if you build this out bigger and bigger, the community is as strong as its members. And if, if the community becomes very valuable to be a part of, 
then your token's going to go up. But that should not be the, the overdriving reason to get in, right? That should be just this thing that happens. It's interesting because we've seen quite a lot of pushback against NFTs from the gaming community. Do you think um, that the, the the music fan community is is has been more receptive, and and why do you think that that would be the case? No, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's just uh, pushback everywhere because I mean, literally everything you see. Why are the, all these experts on TV talking about NFTs when they don't understand NFTs? I mean, it's, it's crazy, you know, and you get these like conversations in mainstream or you get like that piece on CNN, which was just awful. It's like, they didn't even ask one person that knows what's going on ab about their opinion. They just wanted to, it's like a hit piece for what reason? Um, and so I find it just so funny to be living through this time where I think I can see the kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's just, you're just trudging through this quicksand for now. Um, because humans are storytelling narrative based things, right? They're, they need a story. They need to have a narrative. They rally behind things. They're very tribal. And what's happening now is everything is working against this narrative of this can help you. And so it's, it's become so strong that there's just going to have to be some really nice use cases. I mean, I, I can also steel man the argument that, Hey, if you make certain, um, if you make certain items in Fortnite really rare, it's going to change the dynamic of the game, right? It's going to change people going in there and just trying to get these things to make money. And they're going to be bots in there and they're going to be hacked and they're going to be trying to take these things from people or whatever it is, right? I, I can get the other side of the argument. I think the technology will kind of figure that stuff out. Um, but I, but I, I, I get their side, but I don't even think people are making that argument most of the time. They're just basically making the argument, NFT is bad. This is a scam. You're trying to take my money. Gaming, gamer or gaming companies are trying to figure out other ways to take my money. They're already taking your money. You don't own anything. What are you talking about? You're paying for a subscription pass that you can't sell to anyone. You're buying all the, the, the crap they sell you. Like it's crazy to me, but listen, I, I'm just one guy that sees it one way. Um, and I'm going to try to build things that, that prove out that use case in an ethical way, and we'll see where it goes. So we've talked a lot about Web3. Um, the other sort of buzzy technology of the moment, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it, is, of course, AI. Um, you've posted on Twitter about um, how you're curious about the, uh, the use of AI to, to replicate your voice, maybe create you know, fan-generated Avenge tracks. Um, could you... Give us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on, on, on how the AI scene in music is developing. Yeah, so I think there's a macro here. There's a bigger thing, which we could talk about, which is what happens when we, when we discover how to create consciousness, right? Whether it's artificial consciousness or we kind of figure out what the magic soup is for human consciousness. Now, the macro is kind of how do we feel about creating things that can suffer? How do we feel about creating things that can ultimately get much more intelligent than us, destroy us, et cetera, et cetera. But for now, for this conversation, if you're looking at purely this data brick of taking information and regurgitating it to us in some way, whether it's through music or art or um novels, literature, whatever it is, right? You've, you're, you've basically taken everything humans have ever done or discovered and you're giving it to this thing that can distribute it to you quicker and in a different way. It can mix it up and do it in a different way. I think if you actually look at music, most fans aren't mad that all the drums are already being resampled and replaced. Pro Tools already will quantize your albums and make it perfect. You can auto-tune your voice to do all these other things. But for some reason, they have a problem and, and by the way, if you think about how you write music, it's it's like you're going into your own database of I've listened to Bach, I've listened to The Weeknd, I've listened to Kanye, I've listened to all these things, right? And now I'm going to regurgitate <clears throat> it in this way and spew out my own version of that. AI can be incredibly useful if you have AI doing some of that work for you, right? Give me 20 versions of this chord change or give me, I want to hear a different top line there or, and you take a, a little thing that, you, that interests you and you go somewhere with it, right? So now you're using AI to not only spark ideas, but you're using it in a much quicker way to kind of get to some of these cool little nuggets of gold 
that you kind of like are like, oh, that's cool. Let me see where I can take that, right? So that's not really AI writing a song for you. It's kind of giving you this kind of jumping off point of like, now where can I be creative with it? And I think that will be the next step. And what I think is cool is that, listen, there's a lot of fans that don't want to hear new Avenge Sevenfold. We're 40 years old now. We're going places that are much more eccentric than they want, some of them, right? They might want another version of Waking the Fallen or City of Evil, which are our old records. Now, what's wrong with someone throwing in a prompt and saying, listen to these two records and send me out a new record with 11 songs. And if I was to give up my voice and say, take my voice and, and AI create an album that kind of sounds like that. I think that's incredibly cool. I think it would be really cool. If people can prompt their own versions of what Avenged Sevenfold sounds like. You get the sound you want, you get all these things, but now you're getting different versions of albums that you like. So I think like there's something really cool there and nothing that crazy or wrong about it. I, I back it. I think it'd be cool. As a human, I'm going to be going my own way and making my own stuff that I feel is kind of breaking the mold or, or pushing things forward. I'm giving it the AI more data for the future, right? Like wherever I'm going to take it. But I think it's kind of cool. And I, I would love to give up my voice to where people can create their own versions of our songs or whatever they feel would be cool. And then what I would do is I, was, I would authenticate the us on the blockchain. And I would authenticate the AI on the blockchain. This is AI and this is the real thing. And this is immutable, right? And this is, this is why the blockchain will work here. And so I, I know that sometimes when I think about the future and things are a little foggy, I get things wrong. I don't know where this is going to go, but my feelings right now are those are two incredibly cool use cases and people, it will give people a lot more artistic freedom and a lot more ability to kind of hear things and explore things. And I think AI is going to be an incredible tool for that. I mean, use case. In, in the in the shorter term, we've obviously we've seen AI generated tracks going viral on TikTok with, you know, mocked up vocals from Drake or whatever. Um, how long do you think it's going to be before we see artists going, I'll take a percentage rather than issuing takedown notices? Like, are those conversations already happening in, in record company boardrooms? I assume, and I actually know this, there's a bunch of record labels that are investing in AI companies to get a handle on this. I think the, the music industry, if they were smart, learned a lot from Napster, right? If you think you're going to fight this thing or put it in a box, um, you're going to be wrong. So you're going to have to mold it to something that works within your business model or whatever you're trying to do. So, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, if we're creating AI, humans are creating AI. We should mold it to something that helps the human race, right? The human nature. Like we don't want to just say, okay, well let it go free and, and we created it. And then something terrible could happen. Right. And you should, we should be cautious of that. And we should be cautious of business models that um, stunt artistic growth and freedom, but we should also be cautious of business models that just put us back in the same old business models that have never been that great for artists, right? Like if you look at how the Napster thing happened, labels finally realized that people were willing to pay if it was easy for them and they didn't have to go, you know, dig for files, but they also took a big portion of those companies' equity in return for artist catalog and artists still kept the same percentage of royalties, even though there was no physical product to make anymore. Right. And so all of a sudden the artist kind of got the shit end of the stick. And when you see people complaining about artist royalties on Spotify, it's not Spotify. Spotify pays like 70% of their money to artists. It goes to the label and then you're getting that 13% from the 70%. So you don't want that to happen again, right? Because if labels go in and they own all the AI and they make the same deal and go, okay, 50-50 with the new creator, then you're going to get 13% of the 50% as an artist. So we need to make sure that whatever comes out next, it's actually artist friendly and not the same people buying up the companies and creating the actual legislation that's going to run, you know, whatever AI music is. That's my opinion on it anyways. You know, on the subject of kind of AI generated music based on your voice, um, you know, how would you police like the unauthorized, you know, quote unquote, unauthorized use of your voice? Uh, what if somebody generates a song with just horribly racist lyrics? You know, how, how do you fight that? I wouldn't fight it. I would just say um, these are authenticated on the blockchain and people are free to do whatever they want. I'm a very much freedom of speech kind of guy. I, um, I'm not 
like a full on, like crazy. Like I understand there's, there's gotta be limits. I don't know those limits. I don't think anyone does. I think it's something that society's toggling with, <clears throat> but I, but I'm okay with somebody using an AI generated voice. As long as you could see that some jerk made that right. And that's where I think the authentication comes in. Um, the same thing could happen with giving up the IP on death bats club. What if somebody took the death bats club and they took the death bat and they said, well, this is our Nazi group, right? We would need the community to disavow that, right? As a community go, that's not something that we represent. And I would be happy to come out and disavow it, but I'm not going to go take it down or tell someone they can't do that. I believe, I believe people are good and that the good things will come out of seeing bad ideas. And I think you need to see the bad ideas to know what, is right and wrong with society. And I believe that those discussions need to happen. So I wouldn't be too worked up about it personally. Um, what about as far as it goes, AI's impact on working musicians? Cause obviously there's a lot of musicians who make their living from doing session work, you know, stock music, ad jingles, that sort of thing. It's now very easy for a, someone to, to ask an AI, can you spit out five minutes of music in the style of Hans Zimmer for a car commercial or something? Um, is there a risk to the livelihoods of musicians from AI? I don't think so. I think um, I think we could go through the evolution of society, and, and there's been many moments like this, right? And things just change, and there'll be artists that are working closer with AI to get what they want. But if you want a Hans Zimmer piece, you're probably not going to get AI that uh, that really nails what that guy can do with his own brain moving forward, right? Now, if you're if you're under budget and you can't get a Hans Zimmer piece anyways, you might opt to AI, right? And so I would just need to see some specific example where Hans Zimmer lost a contract or someone lost something. But a lot of times I think it's going to be artists working hand in hand with AI that are going to be able to work quicker, faster, stronger. Uh, sounds very Daft Punk, but you know, like we're going to see a lot of these things. Um, I think it's just going to be a new paradigm shift. And it's just going to be, how do you adapt to it? And, and by the way, if you are a movie or you're a, a TV show that needs a quick soundtrack, I think it's an incredible tool to be able to pull up something Hans Zimmer-esque. But I don't think, you're, I don't think Hans Zimmer is going to be losing any sleep or any business because of it, personally. They couldn't afford him anyways. <laughs> Uh, so as you know, we we put out a call to our readers to ask some questions. We thought we'd throw a couple of those at you, keep them light and quick. Uh, from Sonia, who is Table 9 on Twitter, she asked, as he is painfully and amusedly aware, it's often about clickbait when it comes to sites aggregating in-depth interviews. Uh, she wants to know, has, have you ever gone into an interview planning on saying something that you thought would be the headline and then it wasn't? Most of the time, I think the really interesting things aren't the headline because it's always something, um, it's always something that's, um, knee jerk reactionary for people. Right. So I did an interview recently and one of the throwaway questions was, Oh, you're on this Metallica tour, um, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, we, we turned on that tour at first. It was like in passing, like, but we ended up doing it. And I was kind of talking about the philosophy of, you know, being a headlining act or being a, an opening act. And it was hard for us in our career at that point to take an opening spot, even though it was Metallica, because we, we pride ourselves on this big show. And we weren't able to, and the, but the whole interview was not about that. And then of course it was almost like trying to make it look like we were talking shit on Metallica. Right. And so it was like, you look back and go, aha, like, of course that's what they pulled out. But, and, and you constantly see that with especially music journalism. I think there's a lot of um, fear there where they're constantly trying to get numbers and they know that the way it works in normal society with like TMZ and stuff, they're, they're constantly trying to maybe not misquote you, but present it in a way that there looks like there's a rub somewhere, or some sort of conflict or something that's like a, a hot take. And so you just have to know that there are people that will watch this whole interview and there are people that will just take a headline away and, 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 if I was really that worried about it, I just wouldn't do interviews. But I think it's, I think it's um, important to go speak in these long form sort of discussions so that the people that are interested or the people that are kind of wanting to know where we're coming from can sit down and, and take it all in. And, and you go, there's so much clickbait out there that if you had a conversation with your friends and you're all having, you know, drinks, 
you'd all laugh about the way clickbait works, right? But it works because people click on it. But it doesn't necessarily mean society truly feels like they've been duped by that clickbait. Sometimes they have, but I don't, I don't feel too worried about it, to be honest. So on a, on a slightly lighter note from Trey Not Cool on Twitter, uh, what was your favorite moment or event from the ARG? My favorite moment was when they got, they got a clue that there was something happening in the, this little town or this little area of San Jose, California. They had figured out that there was like, um, like longitude and latitude um, numbers that were hidden in a puzzle that we had. And they're like, do we send someone there? Do we not? And then someone, his name's Pleb in the uh, super Pleb in the uh, discord says, guys, I'm, I'm two hours away. I'll drive there. And everyone's like, oh, yes, yes, yes. So this guy gets in his car and he's like live streaming this thing, right? And he's in the Discord while he's driving two hours. And everyone's like, how far are you? How far are you? you know, everyone's just that countdown to this. Like, is something there? And he gets there and it's raining. It's pouring rain in San Jose. And we had had a venue put up a clue on the marquee in the middle of this town square. And he gets there and he's walking around on his FaceTime and it's, you know, blurry in and out. And we're like on the discord watching with on, on burner accounts and they're in the voice chat. And all of a sudden he's like, Oh my God. And then turns the camera and there it is. Lie bad presents. And it says nobody, which is the, the single of the song, but it was the password into this other part of the clue. And everyone's just going crazy. Oh my God, it's there. It's there. And like, I remember the excitement of like, this wild clue is, are those coordinates or are they not? Will someone drive? Well, I'm going to do it. It took two hours to get there and it was actually there. And I remember just everybody being on a high for like days after that, right? Just the, the fact that there was something on a marquee in the middle of the city. Um, that was a really cool high point where, you know, their hard work paid off and they were really kind of reaping the benefits of this community that they were all a part of in the voice chat. Nice. Uh, let's finish with one more reader question here. This is from Frankie7x.eth. They asked, who is your favorite Death Bats Club member? And thank you for saying it's me. It's Frankie. We love Frankie. <laughs> He's hilarious. He gets in the, he does, you know, he gets in the spaces and he usually um, just talks about how much he loves everybody and how much the community is really like his family. And he's one of those guys that there's a lot of them. There's, uh, there's Dudley. There's so many of them. There's, all these guys that like look out for each other, these girls and guys that look out for each other, send each other notes, send each other stickers, but make merch for each other, um, help each other out when things happen. We had a, we had a, a death recently. One of the girls in the death bat club and her husband, were both members, we just met them at our a party. We threw a car accident, tragic. And they were in the discord and it was, it was that community that was just in there with them. Um, really mourning and trying to be there for a member that had just lost his wife. And, um, and it, so it goes so far beyond, right? There's a music aspect. There's a art aspect, but it really is the community that if you took the band away, um, they would still be there for each other. And so people like Frankie kind of really drive that home. Yeah. Wow. That's really powerful. The way that, this has brought people together to support each other. Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. This is a really great chat. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of the podcast. So stoked. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks guys.